Hi, gang, it's Adam. And Patrick. Coming up on today's episode, we share our spoiler-free review of the Disney Plus original Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. As always, we discuss the latest Disney news, and we close out the show with some quick D. All that and more on today's episode of Gays Do the D. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Patrick Nkazaki. <laughs> we are two people. We are two people living in this mind. That is for sure. Adam Gumshoe Hummel. Two people? Mm, there's more. There's more. But two <laughs> are available at any given moment. <laughs> it's always a party in PK's head. That's right. It's always a house party up on her. Always so, so fun up in that brain of yours. Patrick, mm. how are you doing? I am delightful. Thank you so much for asking. You know, I went and saw the tour of Moulin Rouge last night here in Minneapolis. Boy, oh boy, what what a fantastic spectacle. Like, have you seen it yet? Did it come to Oshkosh, Wisconsin yet? <laughs> I happened to catch the pre-Broadway tryout in Boston several years ago. Oh, I imagine it's changed much since then. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> it's a fun show. It's not, you know, it's not groundbreaking. It it feels like I was saying to my husband Dan last night after the show ended that it was it's so much fun. It's just a really beautiful, really fun show. I feel like after this tour and after Broadway, it feels like a show that will take residence in Las Vegas, maybe that might be where it lives. 100% I said the exact same thing, Patrick. Yeah, absolutely. It's just it's just a fun time, a fun time and Disney's very own Courtney Reed is playing Satine right now. She has the consumption every night on stage. <laughs> she does. Boy, that uh, that little cloth couldn't be redder. They, they really punched that out. <laughs> <laughs> they also managed to cram in every single pop song they could into that show. From the past 30 years, if it was on the radio for more than two days, it was in that show. <laughs> But you're right. It is a fun time. Yeah. If you're a fan of the movie, expect some twists and turns that yeah. maybe weren't presented in the film. Yeah. But it is energy times a thousand on stage. Yeah, they altered it well for the stage. They did some good changes that wouldn't have played as well. Anyways, it was, it's a great show. Go see it if you can. It's just It's just a fun time at the theater. That being said... How are you, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing very well. I don't have consumption, Patrick. Good. Thank goodness I was going to ask you. But speaking of theater, I did mm. happen to catch the touring production of Frozen this week. Oh, it finally made its way to Wisconsin. What did you think? You've seen it before. You saw it on Broadway, didn't you? I did see it on Broadway. You know, I am entertained by that show as yeah. well. And yeah. I just have to give a shout out to Caroline Bowman is a star. I mean, that voice is out of control. We were sitting about 10 rows back from the stage. And when you can hear someone singing over their microphone, you know that it's a powerhouse voice. <laughs> yeah, much like The Lion King, if I go, I just want to see that very first scene. Mm. I just want to see her sing Let It Go because it's so it's so beautiful. They do such good artistry and craft. And, and her voice alone is, is, is outstanding. But the rest of the show, yeah, I would agree. It's, it's, it is a lovely show. <laughs> it's a lovely show. The... First act is much stronger than the second. We've talked about this on the podcast, but we have. man, those first few numbers give you goosebumps. They are so fantastic. Yeah. And obviously, Let It Go is such a moment, but there were choices made that maybe aren't as successful as the movie. I would agree. I, I just didn't think it translated as well as they had hoped it would for, for the stage. I, I almost just kind of want the sing-along version instead. Just having these wonderful, <laughs> amazing singers sing those songs is great. Sven is great. I mean, what a great costume. But anyways, I'm glad you had a good time. I assume you had a good time. You didn't really say you had a good time. I was booing the entire time. <laughs> Fair. That's fair enough. <laughs> no, but Caroline Bowman is the reason to see that show. I mean, just go see yeah. her. For her alone, she's fantastic. Fantastic. Well done, sir. Well done, theater, everybody. Hooray for theater. And, Patrick, speaking of things that are less fantastic, we have some feedback from our last episode <laughs> in which we focused on our spoiler-free review of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. 
we had some feedback in the multiverse of madness as well, I feel like. A lot of conflicting viewpoints to be expected, right? I Mm. mean, we gave our review and we were kind of in the same vein, very similar kind of thoughts and feelings about the movie. But some people were very passionately inspired or at least entertained by it. Yeah, absolutely. It evoked emotions in our tweedles. Starting with Anna who you can find on Instagram at a hickey photos who says, guys, my jaw literally dropped when you compared the movie to Thor (laughs) dark world (laughs) dropped. I really enjoyed this movie. I thought being a Sam Raimi fan makes this film a lot more fun because his signature is everywhere. And I really liked how he weaved it into Dr. Strange's world. Two things I definitely agree with would have worked better as a series. And I would have liked a stronger tie to Spider-Man no way home. I also have trouble reconciling this view of the multiverse with the timelines in Loki, but even when we disagree, it's such a treat to review these movies with you. (laughs) What a great sentiment. And, And we should say new Patreon family member, Anna. Anna, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. We appreciate your support and your opinions when they align with ours. Yeah, can you work on that, please? Next time, can you just praise us for our thoughts and opinions as opposed to going against our viewpoints? Just one or two sentences more, maybe to to front load it with compliments and then give some critiques. Maybe that's let's work on that. But it is a good point. I am not a big fan of Sam Raimi as a director, just just not my cup of tea. And so thus, I just did not like this movie very much. So if you are a fan of that director, it makes absolute sense that you would love this movie. Makes total sense. Yeah. Indeed. Well, let's move on, Adam, to Michael, who writes in from Instagram at underscore Mikey likes it. Michael says, couldn't agree more. The story lacked emotional connection, and I left wanting to better understand Wanda's journey. I, too, found myself taking a bathroom break. Those cameos from the Illuminati was a cheap trick and just didn't do anything for the plot. Ooh. I feel embarrassed asking this, but who are the Illuminati? That was the panel that they were in front of. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Michael. <laughs> They're a big part of the Marvel Universe. I get it. Yeah, the panel. Interesting. Obviously, they're bringing in some characters we've seen before and then new characters played by new actors. It felt gimmicky, but we'll see where it goes. It could turn out to be the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to the Marvel Universe. How positive am I? You're very positive. I like what you're drinking, apparently. Iced coffee? Is that what you're having? It's doing something wonderful for your emotions today. I am having an iced coffee. Thank you for pointing that out. Let's switch (laughs) back to the other side of the spectrum, Patrick, with Derek's thoughts. Derek wrote into us from Instagram at boy who has everything. I should have sung that. Patrick, do you want to take a moment? Boy who has everything. Oh my God, like butter. Move over, Streisand. Derek (laughs) says, damn, y'all really hated this movie, huh? While I do wish we got more time showing Wanda's path to the dark side, and also wish the director bothered to watch WandaVision, he didn't. Ooh, I really appreciate how fast-paced it felt. I was constantly entertained, if not somewhat confused, (laughs) and enjoyed a few hours suspending my disbelief. Seeing the MCU dip their toes in the horror genre also excited me, while at the same time wishing it had been pushed even farther. Thanks for another wonderful episode. You know, my past lovers also say the same thing. They were constantly entertained, if not somewhat confused. They also appreciated a brush with horror. And suspending their disbelief. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. Oh, dear. (laughs) Another great point raised, though. These movies are raising the bar for directors and any staff, the writing staff, the directing staff, the producers, have to pay attention so closely now Mm. to all of the things that are happening in the Marvel Universe Mm. when it comes to Disney. And it was a miss, I felt, that this director didn't watch WandaVision. It feels like, well, now that makes sense, that you didn't really tie in what had already happened. I don't know. It's it, It feels like a miss to me. Yeah, I agree. It felt messy, that transition between WandaVision and then seeing Wanda in this film. There just wasn't enough connected to that experience or kind of like shepherding us into that experience. Like she was just Mm. like evil right out of the gate. Right. These movies can't be standalones anymore because we as an audience already know too much. But at the same time, like maybe we should 
petition for more standalone films to be made. Like maybe we're just getting too mixed up. Like maybe things <laughs> need to be separated out a bit so that we're not constantly looking for like loopholes or mistakes or, yeah. you know, maybe the case can be made for more standalone films that we can just enjoy on their own. Agreed. Agreed. Spider-Man No Way Home is a good example. That felt like a really mm. nice standalone film that was all about Spider-Man. Whereas Doctor Strange, I can see, kind of needs to tie in all of the worlds because of his power. Yeah. No, I get it. I get why they did it, Patrick. It's just <laughs> kind of messy. Fair. Fair enough. Well, let's move on. Last but not least, we have Chris from Instagram at Chris underscore coming underscore through. Chris says, hey, guys, I totally agree. I found this movie underwhelming. The prosthetic work on Zombie Strange was a bit cringe. I also <laughs> feel like all of Scarlet Witch's character growth from WandaVision kind of got thrown out. She went from regretful and coming to terms with Vision's death to a straight up murderer, question mark. Also felt bad for Rachel McAdams because she had nothing to do in this movie. <laughs> I'm hoping to make it to Gay Days this year. Ooh, hope all is well. See you on the next podcast. Very, very toothy smiley emoji. <laughs> so descriptive. I love that. <laughs> it's real toothy. <laughs> Yeah, these are great points, Chris. I mean, the fact that you agree with us, obviously, we're going to dive right into this. <laughs> Wonderful yeah. points. And Rachel McAdams, you talked, talked about this briefly on the podcast, Patrick. She really mm. didn't really have that much to do. And on top of that, if I was her, I would murder the costume designer because they did her no favors. <laughs> Yeah, I listen, we we both we've we've beaten this horse to death. The the art direction behind this movie was not where we wanted it to be and the Rachel McAdams of it all was not where we wanted her to be. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Well, thank you everybody yes. for your wonderful viewpoints even when you disagree with us. All joking aside, we <laughs> love hearing from you because it really does make us take a step back and consider our own kind of opinions and question our taste level. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen, I don't I don't question my taste level. I know where I am. I I <laughs> I see myself for me, but I appreciate all of the other opinions that are out there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Should we just stick with Marvel while we're talking about Marvel, Patrick? Ooh, let's do. I like where you're going with this. Last week, the trailer for She-Hulk Attorney at Law premiered. It's coming to Disney Plus in a nine-episode series that starts on August 17th. Patrick, share your thoughts on this new superhero coming to the MCU. I'll say this, first of all. I'm in love with the title because it already tells me all I need to know, that this mm -hmm. is going to be a little bit cheesy, a little bit yeah. fun, a little bit bonkers, a little bit retrospective of all these weird, you know, SVI, SCI, I don't know the acronyms anymore, but... It looks really fun. And then <laughs> the trailer dropped and, and I was not I was not disappointed. I think it's going to be exactly where I thought it was going to be. I can't remember the actress's name, but she already has a really good comic timing mm. and just from the trailer alone. So I think I think I'm going to be in love with this show. You are speaking of Tatiana Maslany. I am. I am indeed. What are your thoughts, Adam? I sound like a broken record at this point, but, you know, Marvel <laughs> exploring other genres, right? Now we're getting mm. a series that's presenting superheroes, but also a romantic comedy, which I love romantic comedies. So uh, yeah. this feels kind of like a great match for me in the sense that it has comedy, it has romance, and it also has a great little angle in Jennifer Walters as an attorney kind of mm. focusing on superhero law. Mm -hmm. It feels like a good mixture of these different genres that you and I really both kind of cling to. And, mm -hmm. and it feels like it's going to be a nice wink to Allie McBeal. <laughs> to Allie McBeal. To, to sort of a, a sarcastic crowd, if you will. Yeah, we want that wink. We need that wink. And also we have a stacked cast. We've got Mark mm. Ruffalo as Bruce Banner. He's going to be in all nine episodes, which is really great. And then just a blink and you miss it appearance in the trailer, but Tim Roth returning as Abomination. Yeah, interesting. I'm interested to see where that goes. So overall, it sounds like we're excited for this one. Again, it is going to premiere on Disney Plus on August 17th. So keep an eye out, folks, and uh, let us know what you think about the trailer as well. Well, moving on, Adam, coming up before 
August 17th. This June, we want to remind all of our Tweedles out there that Enchanted Pride is coming up. What's Enchanted Pride, you may ask? I'll tell you right now. It is going to be a a social mixer, a gathering, a cocktail hour, if you will, hosted by yours truly, that's me from Gays Do The D, and Chris from Wishful Thinking. We are hosting a evening at Splitsville Luxury Lanes on June 3rd of this year during Gay Days from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock p.m. All of the proceeds from that evening are going to go to Equality Florida. That's Equality Florida doing the work to help all of our LGBTQ+, I would say, battered upon lately, (laughs) Tweedles out there. Yes, Equality Florida is doing wonderful work to hopefully abolish Florida's don't say gay law. So if you are free and you're planning to attend Gay Days, please, please consider purchasing a ticket. They're only $20, Patrick, and that money goes straight to Equality Florida. That's right. Absolutely. And what does $20 get you? It gets you in the door. Absolutely. It gets you a chance to win many, many prizes. I, I got a glimpse at some of the prizes that we are going to be offering that evening. And and I'll tell you what, they are top notch. There's a lot of them. You will almost be guaranteed to win your money back in prizes that evening. It's going to be a really fun night. We do, in fact, have a representative from Equality Florida who is going to be there to uh, answer your questions, to mingle amongst you, and hopefully educate you on what's going on in Florida right now. You can purchase tickets. Tickets are still available by going to gaysdothed.com and clicking on Enchanted Pride, or head on over to wishfulthinking.com. That's wishful dash thinking dot com where you can purchase your tickets if you can't be there but you still want to help the event and you want to help equality florida you can still purchase sort of what we're calling maybe a ghost ticket if you Mm. will a a a haunted mansion ticket maybe (laughs) (laughs) which means you can uh donate your money and you can just leave us a little note that you can't be there but you're thinking of us and you want to help our cause I love that, a ghost ticket. So there is a chance (laughs) that this event will lead to some supernatural behavior. Oh, there's more than a chance. It's a guarantee. (laughs) And I love on top of this, too, you are going to be in a private space. So this won't be like you'll be mingling with the regulars at Splitsville. No, you will be (laughs) in a secluded space with all of your LGBTQ plus friends. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So once again, purchase your tickets right now at gazedothed.com or at wishfulthinking.com. It should be a wonderful evening. And you can purchase a ticket at the door as well if you don't want to purchase ahead of time. But I will say, if you do purchase ahead of time online, there is an option to donate additional money toward Equality Florida. And that gets you entered into very exclusive, very luxury gifts and prizes. Luxury gifts and prizes. I love that. Who among us doesn't love a luxury prize? Well, you know what I love more than a luxury prize, Patrick, is learning about this week in Disney history. Oh, that's me. That's me. I would call this week in Disney history ultra luxury. (laughs) It's true. It's It's the gold standard of a luxury vacation. Platinum. Platinum standard. Mmm, Platinum Plus, if you're Disney. (laughs) Anytime you want anything to be more than what it actually is, just throw that plus sign right behind it. (laughs) I put it behind my name these days. Patrick Plus is coming at you (laughs) right now. (laughs) Kind of overselling a little bit, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, that's true. All right, let's move on. Here we are. (laughs) This week in Disney history, starting out with a birthday 119 years ago, on May 24th, 1913, matte designer, special effects creator, and Disney legend Peter Ellenshaw was born in London. Now, Ellenshaw is best known for his iconic matte paintings. He worked for Disney as a special effects technician and matte artist on movies like Treasure Island, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Old Yeller, Pollyanna, Swiss Family Robinson, The Absent-Minded Professor, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, and Mary Poppins, for which he won an Academy Award. After his retirement, he was brought back to work on The Black Hole in 1979 and for Dick Tracy in 1990. If you remember all those beautiful cityscapes That was Peter Ellenshaw. Look up images of his matte paintings. You have for sure seen them before, both online, in movies, and in any Disney art store these days. 
Love this. I was not aware of Peter Ellen Shaw, but I was certainly aware of his work and the artistry behind it. Mm. Kind of CGI before CGI, right? Like if you think about yeah. these amazing special effects where they would just shoot a tiny image and then the matte painter would come in and fill in the rest of the image with these beautiful landscapes or cityscapes, as you mentioned, Patrick. Mm. Such phenomenal artwork. Yeah, if you if you think of those beautiful sweeping London scapes in mm-hmm. in Mary Poppins, that's mm-hmm. that's our Peter Ellenshaw. Wow, incredibly talented. I celebrate Peter Ellenshaw now. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. Moving on, more recently, 39 years ago, on May 25th, 1983, as part of the opening of Disneyland's new Fantasyland, Pinocchio's Daring Journey officially opened to the general public. Now, the site was the original home to the Mickey Mouse Club Theater when Disneyland first opened in 1955. And fun fact, this attraction is the first Disneyland attraction to have originally appeared in Tokyo Disneyland before coming to Disneyland California. It is also the very first attraction created by Disney to use holographic material. Creepy vibes, creepy vibes. I always get the creeps (laughs) on that ride. It's a spookier version of Pinocchio, although Pinocchio is kind of a spooky movie, I would say. It is. Maybe Disney's first horror film, really. (laughs) Yeah, that was their dipping their toe into into horror, if you will. And I've talked about this in the podcast before, but I do not like that monstro jumping out at you. It's a little creepy. It's a little it's a little uh, monstrous, if you will. It is. All right, Patrick, those were two wonderful moments in Disney history for this week in Disney history. And before we move on to the news, listen, folks, you've probably been reading the trades. I don't know how it got leaked. (laughs) It was either Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas or Patrick. Patrick, Mm -hmm. do you want to take credit for leaking the news? I do not want to take credit for leaking this news. It is not news I would have ever have chosen to leak. Well, someone leaked it. But folks, I am going to be retiring from the podcast. I'm going to be stepping away. So my final episode as official co-host of Gays Do the D will be episode 200. That's right. A little bit later this year. For reference, we're at episode 195 right now as you're listening. So in five more episodes, Adam, unfortunately, sadly, and selfishly, I'll say, we'll be leaving. (laughs) (laughs) We'll be stepping away from the podcast. (laughs) That's right. You've got 10 weeks with me, really. I mean, if you think about it, but five episodes, and then I'll be stepping away. And really, there's no great reason other than Patrick has purchased all the shares of GDTV Mm. and is forcing me out of the company. That's right. I own 51% of this company. He does now. He's pulling a real... I was going to say John Cusack, but... (laughs) (laughs) listen i'll take it i'll take that (laughs) yeah patrick's pulling a real joan cusack here with that move (laughs) no but in all seriousness i'm going to be focusing on my house which as all of you probably know it's an older house that i purchased last year and i'm really excited to do some renovations on it that we've already started on which is very exciting and i'm just going to be spending some more time with my family and friends and my other various podcasts (laughs) And I have nothing to do, so I am going to continue <laughs> with, <laughs> with this podcast. But in reality, we we are, of course, ve- I personally am, am very sad to see Adam go. It still hasn't really hit me yet. But fear not, Tweedles out there. The podcast will be continuing. And who knows, Adam may pop in and out variously throughout the year. We, we, we don't know. We may pull him back in here and there. He is giving me the side eye like, mm, that's probably not going to happen. But... Fear not, it will happen. It will, I guarantee you. I'll be making guest appearances. I like that for me. I like a little Mm. guest appearance for me. I like that storyline for you, but I will not be hosting it alone. No, no, I do not have that much power (laughs) in, in, in my talent repertoire. We will be not replacing Adam, but we will be submitting other co-hosts, a rotating cast of co-hosts, if you will. In fact, some voices you've heard before on the podcast, some voices that are going to be new to you on the podcast, but we're very excited about the selected co-hosts that we've chosen. They're going to be starting their reign here on Gun Gaze Do the D <laughs> along with me in a rotating fashion, as I said, the episode after Adam leaves us. So episode 201 will be the first time you'll have a brand new episode. We're going to keep the format as it is. Don't worry about that. Unless you don't like it, let us know. We can make some changes. Now's the time. But we will still be here for you. We're going to give you as much entertainment as you can handle here on Gaze Do the D. 
I love this. I love this kind of rotating cast of co-hosts because it'll just bring more diverse Disney voices to yes. the podcast and more differing opinions. And, you know, people are sick of me at this point. They know what I can deliver. Mm, but no. let's hear let's hear some new voices. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That. Who knows? Maybe sometimes I won't be here for an episode and it will just be our other hosts that are joining us for Gaze of the D. We are confident that you're going to fall in love with them the way that we have fallen in love with them. And we're excited to uh, bring them on to the show. We will announce their names a little bit later on. We're not going to do that right now. But... All that being said, we will, of course, miss you here on the podcast, Adam. All the Tweedles, I know I can speak on behalf of them. You are the force behind the reason we even started this podcast. Oh, my God. Patrick's crying right now, everybody. (laughs) That is absolutely not true. I am (laughs) excited to finally have my voice heard around here. There will be plenty of time for official goodbyes in episode 200. So in the meantime, we're just going to keep chugging along and producing the real quality Disney content you've come to expect when you listen to Gaze Do the D. (laughs) I'm laughing because we don't have an ounce of quality in us. We have have equality, but we don't have quality. (laughs) Speaking of lack of quality, Patrick, should we head into the news? Ooh, let's fumble the news, won't we? We will. We will. (laughs) I've got some interesting and slightly confusing Disney World (laughs) updates for all of your nerves. (laughs) This June 8th, Disney Genie Plus will no longer be available for advanced purchase. Guests will now only be able to purchase Genie Plus through the My Disney Experience app on the day of your actual visit to the park. This is effective for all ticket type holders, including annual pass holders and multi-day ticket holders. Anyone who has already made advanced purchases of Genie Plus for 2022 will not be affected. Now, interestingly, Disney also changed the language on the Genie Plus purchase platform, stating that Genie Plus is subject to availability indicating that they will be limiting the amount of purchases per day, which could then indicate more availability of attractions on any given day. According to the site, starting on June 8th, Genie Plus purchases will be available starting at midnight for the day of your visit, and Lightning Lane selections will be available at 7 a.m., which means if we do see Genie Plus selling out on a regular basis, guests will need to set an alarm for midnight to get Genie Plus and then again for 7 a.m. to even be able to fully utilize the value of the purchase. And if you want to also grab a newer attraction with a virtual queue, God bless. God bless you. What is going on here? <laughs> I don't fully understand this. I'm I'm sure there's a reasoning somewhere out there, but I'm I'm not seeing it. I'm totally fine with not being able to pre-purchase Genie Plus. I mm. get it. Like if we're gonna follow though, like the Disneyland model of mm. You know, purchasing Genie Plus day of, let's make it truly follow that model and have it be like once you enter the parks, you can make your selections or I don't know, like this is getting so complicated and so convoluted midnight. What the hell? Yeah, it's now becoming more complicated than FastPass Plus was, which is why they got rid of FastPass Plus, because it was too complicated and there were too many complaints about it. But now it's overcomplicating itself again, it seems to me. And it seems like they're shooting themselves in the foot a little bit, or they planned very poorly in that now they're finding that they have to limit purchases of Genie Plus because, what, there's too many people purchasing Lightning Lane passes? Yeah, I think there were too many people purchasing it, and then so many people were able to get those first waves that a lot of people who then purchased it and didn't get the first waves of attractions could only get on one or maybe two attractions for the day, which that's not worth the value of the price of Genie Plus. Oh, this is so frustrating and so confusing. It's just getting worse. It's getting worse. And if you're not able to get on three attractions in a day and you have to pay for it, then why aren't we going back to Fast Pass Plus then, where you were guaranteed three rides a day, right? And, and you didn't have to pay for it if you were staying on the resort. You know what I'm willing to pay for? I'm willing to pay an upcharge in ticket price Mm. simply to have all of this crap removed and just have it be fair game for all. (laughs) 
I'm I'm with you on that. I'm fully with you. This seems overly complicated. It also seems like it's unfair to those who maybe don't have access to smartphones or don't have you know what I mean? It feels like it's it's excluding a large number of guests. Yeah, can you even get Genie Plus on a track mobile phone? We don't know. We simply don't know. <laughs> We're not sure yet. Testing is happening right now. Well, moving on, speaking of those virtual queues, Disney has officially confirmed that starting on May 27th, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind will begin boarding with a virtual queue, opening up on the My Disney Experience app at 7 a.m. and again at 1 p.m. Now, guests staying at a deluxe resort with extended evening hours will also be able to get in the virtual queue at 6 p.m. You will not need to be in the park for the 7 a.m. or the 6 p.m. queues, but you will need to be in the park for the 1 p.m. queue. And guests participating in extended evening hours will be able to join the queue twice, once during regular park hours and once again for evening hours. Okay, got it, I think. I do like the part about extended evening hours getting kind of their own special access to a queue. That makes sense to me. Absolutely. We should be rewarding the rich. They don't have enough, Patrick. They need <laughs> more. They do. They do indeed. Now, moving on to more interesting and confusing news. Kite Tales in Animal Kingdom will have its last scheduled performance on May 26th. Now, notice I said scheduled performance. Kite Tales will be revamped and shortened to more frequent pop-up moments throughout the day. And now, a quote from Disney... We are shifting the focus of the show so guests will be able to experience Disney Kite Tales from anywhere around the Discovery River Lagoon with shorter and more frequent performances throughout the day, end quote. So now guests will unexpectedly be hit by a giant kite instead of <laughs> scheduling that into their day. <laughs> This makes sense to me. Now, I have not seen Kite Tales aside from horrific photos and videos <laughs> online of people just getting smashed by kites. Just kidding. But mm. I, I like this idea of just kind of having it be like a magical moment where like, you know, you see Simba mm -hmm. kind of floating around <laughs> the amphitheater and then he just disappears. And that's that. Like, I like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not mad at this. And we, we we foretold this happening, right? I think it's just a slower death than we thought it would be for <laughs> Kite Tales. <laughs> for Kite Tales or for the people getting hit by the kites? Yes and yes. Yes, both <laughs> on that one. <laughs> And now rounding out this story, finally, you will once again be able to get your hair did in the Magic Kingdom. Starting on July 31st, the Harmony Barbershop on Main Street, USA, will once again open its doors to anyone in need of feeling a little itchy for the rest of their day. <laughs> <laughs> and it has been announced that the Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique will also open its doors later this year. Very exciting. I've always wanted to pop into that barber shop, and I never have. And I just imagine it being a chart of cuts, and you just point to one that you want, and that's what you get. <laughs> it's all high and tight. It's just all high and tight cuts. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, in a post on Disney Parks' blog by Global Marketing Senior Vice President and member of the LGBTQIA plus community, Lisa Beckett, Disney announced the launch of their annual Rainbow Merch Collection. This year, however, with the company still reeling from backlash by queer activists after a lack of public opposition to Florida's Don't Say Gay bill, back when it was a bill, and the growing criticism from right-wing lawmakers and conservative groups over over the company's eventual denunciation of the bill and law, Disney has noted that their rainbow merchandise collection will henceforth be known as their Disney Pride Collection. The Disney Pride Collection has been dreamed up and designed by members and allies of the community for members and allies of the community. And this year, Disney will be donating all of its profits from the Disney Pride Collection sales now through June 30th, 2022, to organizations that support LGBTQIA plus youth and families. This includes merchandise from Disney, Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars. In the U.S., profits from the collection will benefit Glisten, P-Flag, The Trevor Project, 
Zebra Coalition, the Los Angeles LGBT Center, the LGBTQ Center of Orange County, the San Francisco LGBT Center, and the Alley Forney Center. Profits from other regions around the world will continue to support local charities in those countries. You can learn more about these organizations and their incredible, impactful work by visiting TWDCPrideCollection.com. I mean, we made this happen, didn't we? We foretold it, and it is so. <laughs> we are, we're witches today in the news, aren't we? <laughs> we put all our energies into this, Patrick, and mm. yeah, I guess you thank us, Tweedles. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome so much. No, this is great. This is the right decision through and through. It's, it's literally the least they could do right now, I think, but it is a big step in the right direction. I hope it's a wild success. I hope it completely sells out. And I hope they extend this. Mm -hmm. Like, why not always be bringing out new rainbow merch? It doesn't just have to be limited to June. Excuse me, Adam. New pride merch. I'm just not comfortable with it yet, Patrick. I'll get there. (laughs) I will get there. (laughs) You're, You're at the maybe I'll say gay stage right now. It's really just my own internal homophobia, Patrick, but I'll get past it. You're whispering gay right now. (laughs) (laughs) Gay. Just in time for summer, the rhinos in Animal Kingdom are working on their fitness. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Some of the rhinos on the safari in Animal Kingdom have been fit with step trackers, much like a Fitbit. The activity trackers will help the animal care experts learn more about their activity levels throughout the day and exactly when they start to settle in for the evening. The trackers are able to determine whether the rhinos are walking, running, or lying around, and it will better help them understand their napping and sleeping schedules. The tracker is also able to locate exactly where the rhinos are to better determine where they prefer to spend most of their time, allowing the experts to update their habitat to suit the rhinos' needs. Now, this latest experiment is part of a larger effort to ensure a growth in the population for this endangered species. Once complete, the research will be compiled and shared with 74 other accredited animal care facilities to help ensure that rhinos will receive the best care possible around the world. I can only take in this story and digest it fully (laughs) as someone who has been less than active for the past (laughs) two to three years. And I am now concerned that the rhinos will be more active than me. (laughs) I think it's beyond a concern at this point, Adam. It's more of an intervention at this point. I need help. And (laughs) I guess I need to look to rhinos for inspiration. (laughs) Don't we all? I mean, that's the takeaway here. (laughs) All right, people, let's just get through this last story. Okay. Everyone hold hands. Remember how blissful our last episode was with no news story even mentioning Ron DeSantis? Well, we're back at it. We're back at it. (laughs) He's back, back, back again. After stripping Disney of its special governing powers last month, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis now says that he wants the state to take over the Reedy Creek Improvement District. According to a Monday, May 16th CNN article, DeSantis told reporters, quote, The path forward is Disney will not control its own government in the state of Florida. Disney will have to follow the same laws that every other company has to follow in the state of Florida. They will pay their fair share of taxes, end quote. The remarks offered the first glimpse into DeSantis's plan for Reedy Creek after the governor and Republican lawmakers passed a new law last month to dissolve the district in a special session, a move that critics have said was retaliation for Disney speaking out against a new Florida law that will limit what schools can teach about sexual orientation and gender identity. The fate of Disney, Florida's largest employer and the district's existing debt remains unclear in the weeks after the contentious vote. Democrats and local officials have suggested that local governments and taxpayers in the surrounding counties of Osceola and Orange could be on the hook for the debt if Reedy Creek ceases to exist. 
But DeSantis promised local and state taxpayers would not have to pay for Reedy Creek's outstanding debt, which we all know is about $1 billion. He went on to say that the state government would likely collect more taxes once Disney's special status is eliminated when it's on more equal footing with other theme parks operating in Florida. DeSantis did not provide details on how the state would assume control of Reedy Creek. In Florida, the governor appoints board members who oversee many of the state's special districts. Before this new law, Reedy Creek board members were people who owned property within the district's boundaries, primarily people with ties to Disney. It is unlikely that a plan for Reedy Creek and Disney will be finalized until after the November elections, DeSantis said, because he wants input from incoming legislative leaders. The new law that would dissolve Reedy Creek does not take effect until June 2023. But DeSantis was adamant that he does not believe stewardship of Reedy Creek and its government duties, including operating the fire department, water systems, roadways, and building inspectors for Disney's properties should fall to local governments. Another quote from Ron DeSantis, and if you can decipher what he's saying here, you are an absolute genius, and I applaud you. Quote, first of all, it'd be a cash cow for them if they had Disney, but I'm worried that they would use that as a pretext to raise taxes on people when that's what they would want to do anyways, and then try to blame Reedy Creek, so we're not going to give them that opportunity, end quote. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he doesn't want Disney to run their own operations, but he doesn't want anyone else to run their operations either. He wants himself to run their operations. I don't understand where he's coming from here. He wants the state of Florida to oversee the district, I guess, and he somehow thinks that it'll be more of a cash boon for the state, I guess, if I'm reading this correctly, than if Disney continues to run it. It just seems very clear that he doesn't understand what's going on here and what Disney was actually doing with <laughs> with their own sort of self-governing. And I want to be very clear, Disney was still paying attention to the law. Like that was right. part of the deal that they still had to abide by all of the laws under the state of Florida and nationally. So they weren't doing anything wrong here. And this was bestowed upon them by the state of Florida. None of what he's saying makes any sense, as per usual. He's probably going to run for president, right? Uh, this is 100% what he's doing. <laughs> I mean, there's no there's no two ways about that. We're going to have to listen to this in debates. <laughs> I mean, we don't have to listen to it, but it will be out there. It's just like our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Trilogies, Patrick. Trilogies are often a sign of a successful franchise. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm confused about where you're going with this. We all are. We're all confused, Patrick. Oftentimes, the first movie may be great. The second movie may also be great, but maybe falter a little bit. The third movie may not be as great, but you know what? Hollywood wants that money, and we are following that model, Patrick, mm. by concluding our trilogy of reviews on this podcast. Yes, if you recall, Tweedles, way back when we started with Better Nate Than Ever, then in our last episode, we focused on Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and we are closing out our trilogy of episodes featuring reviews with Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. For a hot second, I won't lie to you, for a hot second, I was like... Oh, did I watch the wrong movie? <laughs> <Today>? <laughs> did you? We'll find out. We don't know. Did you? <laughs> we, we will find out. We will find out. A Disney Plus original that both Patrick and I have been looking forward to and mm. was created by the funny, funny people behind the Lonely Island, that great comedy group. And on top of all of that, Patrick, we have a reboot of a very successful animated series 
from, well, definitely your childhood, not necessarily mine, but yours. I mean, you're not that much older than I am, Adam, but you, you mean that you just didn't watch it when you were younger. I guess it was less about my age and more about my family's complete poverty and that we did not have the Disney Channel. Got it. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, this wasn't necessarily uh, in your line of sight while you were growing up, whereas for me, I was obsessed with Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. Yeah, I just missed that window. I don't know what happened. In fact, I'm not even sure I've seen an episode, Patrick. Oh, interesting. They are all on Disney Plus right now. Interestingly, it is a three season show, but they are on Disney Plus as one full season of, I think, like 45 episodes. I don't know why they laid it out that way. That is curious. What's going on over there? Not really sure. But yeah, I was as a youngster and still today, I will say a huge fan of the full Disney afternoon lineup, including Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. And as I mentioned, the Disney Plus original is now available on Disney Plus. So if you've had a chance to check it out, sit back, relax, and listen to our spoiler-free review. But if you haven't, again, it is a spoiler-free review, so we will not be ruining any major plot points for you, I hope. Who knows? Did I ruin the Scarlet Witch in Doctor Strange? (laughs) Probably. I mean, I mentioned that she was the villain, and that probably ruined it for some people. Well, if they've never seen the poster, then yeah, you ruined it. But if they've seen the poster, then you did not ruin it. In my opinion, doesn't matter. The movie ruined itself. (laughs) Plus, I like a little element of danger in every spoiler-free review we have, right? Like, are they going to spoil something? Are they not? Who knows? Well, this one feels a little bit more of a a safer territory, if you will, in that it's Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. It's just a good, fun movie. There are some twists and turns here and there. We're not going to give those away, but we are going to talk about some things we loved about the movie, some things maybe we didn't really like about the movie, and just our general opinion about the movie at large, or at small, because they're chipmunks. They're so, so tiny. IMDb summarizes the plot of the film as 30 years after their popular television show ended, Chipmunks Chip and Dale live very different lives. When a cast member from the original series mysteriously disappears, the pair must reunite to save their friend. That's a succinct little description there, I would say. No spoilers there. I love it. No spoilers there. Absolutely. Well, let's start out, Adam. Just a general overall opinion of the movie. I believe we both watched it yesterday, probably, or early this morning. I'm not sure. I did give it a watch yesterday. I liked it overall. Like I said, Mm -hmm. I didn't have a connection to Chip and Dale growing up, aside from like the very older comedy shorts that they were in, the cartoon shorts, like Pluto's Christmas tree, stuff like that. So I I guess what I should be saying is I didn't have a connection to Rescue Rangers. But overall, Mm. I liked this. I thought maybe the gags were more prominent than the story itself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and not surprising given the writing staff, the directing, and the lead characters in the movie, the lead voice actors in the movie. This was full of their type of comedy. Absolutely. But overall, it was enjoyable. It was a fun little adventure. I liked the kind of take, the meta take on them being actors, Chip and Dale, who Mm. were in Rescue Rangers. Like, I like that concept. Mm -hmm. And it was fun how the creative team kind of peppered in various characters from Disney and now Fox that Disney owns. Like, there were nonstop pop-up appearances by various characters. (laughs) Yeah, Easter eggs galore. This is the movie that you could watch over and over again and see something new in the background every single viewing. How did you feel about it overall? Well, this movie, I feel like, was absolutely geared toward someone like me, toward Mm. my age range and toward someone who was a big fan of Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. It was a love letter to that show and a love letter to all of the fans of that show. I feel like they didn't stray away from it. They didn't make too much fun of it. They just sort of celebrated Chippendale's Rescue Rangers and the Disney afternoon in general and just that genre in general and pushing it toward where we are now in life and and giving it comedy that meets us on our level right now. I would say this is maybe not necessarily a movie that kids are going to understand or fully Mm -hmm. appreciate as much as the adults who watch that show will, but I do think that they'll enjoy it. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, Patrick. How would kids respond to this who maybe had not been introduced to Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers yet? Mm -hmm. Or even Chip and Dale, for that matter. Like, you know, were they aware of these characters? And if they weren't, was this story engrossing enough for them? Did it give them enough to, like, latch on to and appreciate as little kids? Yeah, it's interesting because for all intent and purposes, this is 
quote unquote a children's movie, right? It's it's a Chippendale movie, which is generally geared towards children. But I, I got the impression that this was a hundred percent written for people in their mid to late thirties and forties who grew up with Disney Afternoon. Uh, and it, like I said, it was a love letter to that generation. Yeah, I get that, and I think that maybe where I had a bit of an issue with it. Issue isn't the right word, but like. Mm. It just seemed to want to walk a fine line of like trying to be safe enough to appeal to children, right? Mm -hmm, But then also mm -hmm. cater to those that grew up with the series and are now adults. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was looking for more of an edge on that side of the line. Like I just wanted a little bit more of a bite to the comedy, like not things that would be inappropriate for the kids, but Mm -hmm. just things that would absolutely go over the heads of children, but we'd be more of a wink to the adults. Yeah, for sure. But I I did actually find those moments. I mean, for goodness sake, there was a quote very early on in the movie where, who is it, Dale says, I'm into nuts. And it was so funny. It was it was very clearly <laughs> a joke written for adults, right? That kids wouldn't understand. And and so I, I did actually find those moments that that played both sides of the uh, of the aisle, if you will. That was funny enough for a kid and they didn't understand, but had enough of an innuendo for an adult that you're like, "Oh, that's funny for a very different reason." Yeah, I guess I mean there was a nuts joke. Yeah. <laughs> In like the first 13 seconds of the movie, I feel like <laughs> Well, let's talk about the creative team behind the film, Patrick. It was directed by Akiva Schaefer, who is part of the Lonely Island comedy group, which I've already mentioned, Patrick, as is Andy Samberg, who voiced Dale in this movie. Yes, absolutely. Very, very funny writer. I I love his humor. He is prolific, I feel like, in his humor. He's just very on, on the nose right now, or not on the nose, on the pulse of like humor that's going on today. And speaking of the writers, we had two writers on the project, Dan Gregor and Doug Mand. Dan Gregor was a writer on the series Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and also on the series How I Met Your Mother. And Doug Mand wrote the 2020 flop, we can call it a flop, Doolittle, starring (laughs) Robert Downey Jr. And was also a writer on the series How I Met Your Mother. And he was also a writer on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend as well, I should say. So yet another writing team, Patrick, on this project. We've had so many reviews where we've had writing teams come in to write the films and series. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, a lot of this film was, it felt like, uh, a, a lot of friends who were working together on a project when it comes to the writing staff, when it comes to the director, and a lot of the cast members. They've all worked together a lot before in the past. And it felt like, for me anyways, it felt like a family had written and directed and starred in this movie. because It felt very cohesive to me. It felt like everyone was on the same page as far as the tone of the film. Yeah, absolutely. As I already mentioned, Andy Samberg, who is a part of the Lonely Island voices Dale and noted comedian John Mulaney Patrick voice Chip. I really, I really enjoyed both of them. I, in the past, John Mulaney, I've been on a journey with John Mulaney. When he yeah. first came out as a comedian, didn't so much latch on to him. He felt like just sort of a privileged white man doing comedy for me. Yeah. That just like yeah. the take I had on him. But the more I got to know his story and the more he's evolved as a comedian, as a performer, I actually really like him now. Yeah, he's become a much more complex human being as we've kind of learned the details of his personal life. And yeah. I think it's kind of softened me to him more knowing that he struggles just like the rest of us, Patrick. <laughs> he does. He does indeed. And I would say actually the same for Andy Samberg. I feel like I've been on a roller coaster with him. I really liked him when he first came out. And then I got too much Andy Samberg, I think, yep. for a while. I got oversaturated with him. And then he started doing not more serious work, but a little bit more, I don't know, intelligent humor, I would say, mm-hmm. which I think he's really good at. And and I re- really appreciate that. And the two of them together, I think, were magical. Yeah, a great kind of modern take on Chip and Dale. These two characters kind of being thrust in the 21st century and like, who would voice these characters when they weren't doing their chipmunk voices? John Mulaney, mm. Andy Samberg, the kind of great personalities to fill those roles. Again, I have to say, and this is not a spoiler, because if you've seen the trailers, you already know this, Chip and Dale are not using their traditional chipmunk voices that they were in Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers and in right. all of the Chip and Dale <laughs> uh, shorts throughout history. And they, they wrapped up that 
very nicely, very quickly in that they are animated actors <laughs> in an animated television show. And so they have their regular voice and then their actor Chippendale voices. And I appreciated that, that they just they didn't harp on it too much, but they gave us a movie where it wasn't going to be annoying to hear these chipmunk voices throughout the entire film. Yeah, that would have been rough. That would have been rough to take for a feature length film. Right, exactly. And so I think I think it was very clever the way they approached that and the way they handled that. You mentioned the fact that they were chipmunk actors in an animated series. Mm. Let's expand upon that a little bit because the world of this film is so unique in that it is humans, animated characters, anthropomorphic objects, all Mm -hmm. coexisting, right? So it's like essentially a world where the real and surreal and like the lines between animated and traditional film, so to speak, are blurred. There's no separation between animation and real life. Right. And I have to believe that they took that inspiration from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, right? In fact, they gave a nod, a very delightful nod to Roger Rabbit, the character himself in this movie. And it, it sort of expands upon that idea, right? It takes that idea and blows it up into a, a different storyline, basically. And also then utilizing the technology that has since been developed since Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So not only do we have traditional 2D animation, but we have an exploration and a lot of jokes about 3D animation or CGI. Yeah, absolutely. And in that, it sort of takes where Who Framed Roger Rabbit left off and then keeps going, right? And so any animation that happened since then is now included in this world as well. It's almost its its own universe then that we're all living in here. A pretty prominent cast aside from the two leads, we have a lot of famous performers coming in to voice some pretty substantial characters in the film. Some we've kind of come to know as voice actors and some kind of making their very first foray into voice acting and doing a wonderful job of it. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of really heavy hitters as well who are playing very minor parts. It's almost as though they were like, hey, can I be included somewhere somehow in this movie? And and they just tagged along for the fun of it. Who were some standouts for you, Patrick? Whose performances did you really enjoy? I have to say, I really laughed super loud when I heard Dennis Haysbert's voice as Zipper. It was... It was so funny, and it was so for the adults in the room, because if you don't know who Dennis Haysbert is, you absolutely do. He played the president on the TV show 24 for 24 years, it feels like. And <laughs> his his voice is so, is so distinct and so amazing, and having him play the real voice of Zipper was, was such a treat. It was such a treat. Very funny moment when we come to know that Zipper, who's a fly, right, Patrick? Mm hmm. Yeah. A tiny little fly has the magnificent base of Dennis Haysbert. <laughs> so, so funny. So, so funny. I also really love I always love J.K. Simmons. I, I have a crush on J.K. Simmons. I want him in every single movie. He plays uh, the, the captain of the police force, basically Captain Putty in sort of a nod to a Gumby like character. Yeah, and I failed to mention that there's also stop motion animation included in this film. So it really is a celebration mm-hmm. of all different forms of animation. It really is. Yeah, black and white, color, sepia tone, like everything, everything is represented animation wise in this movie. We also have Eric Bana voicing Monterey Jack, who obviously did not voice Monterey Jack in the animated series. He did not, but he did a great job. It was a really good impression, actually, of Monterey Jack. I'm glad that they didn't steer away from his voice because his voice wasn't necessarily cartoony, quote unquote, in Mm -hmm. in the animated film. It was just sort of a a fun Australian accent. And so he was a a great choice for that. An interesting choice because it's Eric Bana. I feel like they could have kind of had anybody in, in there, but he did a great job. Yeah, I wonder if he's either like a friend of the creative team or someone on the creative team, or if like Mm. he's expressed how big of a fan of Rescue Rangers he was. And so it was just like a natural choice to bring him on board. Could be, could be. And of course, we have Will Arnett. Like, I mean, he is in every animated thing that's ever been created yeah. these days, playing yeah. Sweet Pete in in the film. I, w- I just love his voice. I just, I, I think it's so fun. He, he, he knows what he has with his instrument, and he doesn't mm-hmm. usually veer too far away from it. And he doesn't need to, because it always is correct in the characters that he plays. What I really liked about his vocal performance in this film was that he didn't lean in so heavily to using his like lower register all of the time. Like, yeah, there's the traditional like Will Arnett graveliness behind it, but he was actually 
modulating it more or like using more of his upper register a lot of the time, which is something we don't normally hear from him. Like, I feel like normally we just hear the Batman, the Lego Batman, you know, super low whisper. Sure. But this time we actually got to hear more variation in his performance. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I just I just love his voice. It's still very distinctly Will Arnett's voice, but it's just and he does a great job. And he's just such a funny person. His comic timing is always on point for me. Just to mention a few of the other vocal performances, names you definitely know, Keegan-Michael Key, Flula Borg, Seth Rogen voices characters in this film, Tress McNeil, I mean, longtime animation vocal artist, Tress McNeil performs in this film. So they have some really wonderful first timers and then kind of longstanding vocal actors in the cast. Yeah, absolutely. And we should mention Tress McNeil is reprising her role as Gadget. The only original cast member to return to do a voice from Rescue Rangers, right? That's a good question because Jim Cummings is also in this movie, but I I wasn't quite sure if he was doing voiceover of original episodes of Chippendale Rescue Rangers or uh-huh. if they were just reusing his voice from Chippendale Rescue Rangers, but he was also doing other voices throughout the film as well. So it's hard to know <laughs> it's hard to know if he was reprising his role or not or if he was just doing other characters throughout the the movie he of course originated the voice of fat cat if you're a fan of the original chippendales rescue rangers he voiced fat cat the the constant enemy i would say of the rescue rangers i put you on the spot with that one didn't i you did you did indeed you tested my brain and it melted a little bit but i think Mm. i got back to where i needed to be he also voiced darkwing duck originally and in this movie as well That's right. Darkwing Duck making an appearance in the film, as do so many animated characters from Disney's past. Indeed. One actor you didn't mention yet, and I think we should talk about him for a hot second. I just want to know your opinion just between you and me and all of our Tweedles listening right now. Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen is also in this movie. He plays a fairly larger character. Thoughts, thoughts and opinions on Seth Rogen in this movie. I did mention him, Patrick, but I'm going to forgive you. Okay, I'm going to forgive you. (laughs) For not listening. And now now that you've even brought it up, I'm questioning if I did mention him, but I think I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> listen, Seth Rogen's fine. Like, I like Seth Rogen. It's hard for me to separate Seth Rogen from... Let me, let me rephrase that. It's hard for me to separate Seth Rogen's personality from the animated character he's playing in the film. I guess I could say the same thing, not really, about... Will Arnett, but there's just, there's something about Seth Rogen, Patrick, there's something about Seth Rogen that's hard for me to believe when it comes to him voicing an animated character. Yeah, I think that's where I am as well. It almost feels like he's not trying very hard. It's it's almost like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's almost like, they're just like, just say these words as though Seth Rogen would say them. And so it feels, I don't know, it, it feels cheap and easy to me, if that makes sense. Well, he's high out of his mind, Patrick. I mean, let's just... <laughs> hey, I don't... Listen, That's a, I don't, that aside, I, who can care? But I just, I don't enjoy the performance of it. I, I, I feel like it's not a performance, if that makes sense. It feels like he's just, they're just catching his voice as he's talking, as opposed to him playing an actual character, which to me, I don't know. It doesn't feel like he's on the same level as everyone else working their butts off in this movie. Yeah, he's a man who knows his brand, and his brand is <laughs> slouchy, laid back, and I think he may be unwilling to expend any more energy than that in <laughs> his artistic endeavors when it comes to voicing an animated character. And hey, joke's on us. He's, he's got all the money in the world. He really does. He really does. <laughs> So we talked about all these animated characters and people voicing them, but there is one prominent actor featured in the film who is human and plays a major role in the film, and that's (laughs) Kiki Lane, who portrays the role of Ellie, a kind of upstart detective in the police department. Yes, yes, indeed. The beautiful Kiki Lane, I should say. And actually, I'm torn about her in this movie, I have to say, in yeah. that I actually really like Kiki Lane. I've seen her in wonderful performances. She she was in Coming to America 2. She was in Native Son. She was in If Beale Street Could Talk. She She's a good actress. And I don't know that working with CGI and animation yeah. was her bag. 
Yeah, maybe this wasn't her genre. It just came off a little bit stilted or maybe she wasn't getting enough from whatever actor she was acting against if there wasn't even an actor there. I just don't know. But it didn't Mm. read as her enjoying the experience that much. Like it just felt like she was a little stagnant. I would say that. I would also say I I will say that she warmed up as the movie Mm. went on. I feel like she got a little bit better and maybe more used to doing this kind of acting because it Mm. is very different, right? You're looking at a green screen and having no motivation. It's I imagine that's really hard to do. So I I can't fault her (laughs) in that. It just this wasn't her genre, as you said. I would also say, and this is not her fault in any shape or form, I felt like she was too young for this role as well. Mm. If this is a character who we're supposed to believe watched Chippendale Rescue Rangers as a youngster on VHS tapes, which was part Uh. of the plot line, she is not old enough to to have done that, I feel like. That's a great point. I didn't even think about that. And, And on top of that, too, she doesn't have a lot of experience with comedy, or at least not that I'm aware of. So that may have mm. been also kind of something that just wasn't as attainable for her as an actor. Like maybe that just isn't her thing or I don't know. They're just it was a little off. It was a little off. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. I, I celebrate Kiki Lane. I really do like her, but I just this was not for me a good fit for her. Agreed. We look forward to your future projects, Kiki. <laughs> we do. We do indeed. So it sounds like if I'm hearing this correctly, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Patrick, but I th- I mm. think you may have enjoyed the movie a bit more than I did based on your relationship with the original animated series, Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. And you seem to enjoy the comedy a bit more, too. It seemed to hit you better than it did me. I think so. And and I, I was wondering this as I was watching it. I was because I knew that you really hadn't seen it much, if at all, mm-hmm. the original cartoon, Rescue Rangers. And it did strike me as this is, as I said in the beginning of this review, this is absolutely a movie geared toward people who know this show and mm-hmm. who are going to pick up on all of the Easter eggs and on a lot of the plot lines. There were there were some storylines where I was like, oh, I remember that. This is a callback to a storyline from the original show that if you mm-hmm. hadn't seen it, you are not going to know that at all. It didn't hurt the story as much, but it but it also I can see from your point of view how it just wouldn't have emotionally latched on to you, whereas it, it did very much for me. Yeah, I actually have to give them credit for kind of setting up those plot lines from the animated series pretty well. Like like I said, mm. I I had not watched the animated series, but I thought they did a good job of like showing the old clips or referencing that this happened in episode so and so, you know, so mm. That was pretty well set up for me as someone who didn't watch Mm -hmm. the animated series. Where I kind of faulted it more was that it just was too bombarding for me with like bits and appearances from animated characters from Disney's past and then bringing in new animated characters like J.K. Simmons' character, Captain Putty, who was, as we mentioned, a reference to Gumby. Like there was just a lot going on in this movie. And I understand that. And There were a lot of different animation styles, and I thought maybe they could have just maybe a little bit curated the aesthetic of the film a little bit more. Like, there there was a lot going on in this movie, almost to the point where, like, did you see Ready Player One, the movie Ready Player One, Patrick? I did, yes. I was getting that from it, where, like, you know, there were all these different characters coming into play, and I thought maybe they could have just zeroed in and edited, in particular, like, the ensemble of animated characters just a little bit more. Mm, interesting. See, I'm I'm on the opposite end of that. I I almost felt like they could have pushed it even further for me because I loved it. I love that Who Framed Roger Rabbit of it all. I loved the sort of even Zootopia. It gave me a little bit of a Zootopia vibe. In sure, that I can there see was that. So many, yeah. yeah, so many background characters that you just blink and you miss it, and it doesn't matter to the plot. It's just funny if you see it, and it doesn't matter if you don't see it. So I actually kind of wanted them to to keep running with that, and and I would appreciate another movie out of it too. I think that it's a fun genre. And I think it is an interesting exploration. Um, And like I said, I just I keep going back to this, but it is such a testament to how strongly the Disney afternoon lineup lives in so many people. And I attached myself to this movie right away. It almost I didn't get like emotional about it, but it gave me the warm fuzzies immediately. Mm -hmm. I totally believe that anyone who had any kind of attachment to that afternoon lineup would be all in Mm -hmm. on this movie. Like the nostalgia factor alone is like at a hundred. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm such a nerd in that there is 
uh, a little bit of a plot line, and this is not giving anything away necessarily, uh, where they sort of explore this Dale character of Double O Dale, kind of. Yeah. And there is an actual episode of Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers called Double O Chipmunks, where Dale <laughs> explores being sort of a James Bond character. So it was a full reference back to the the animated series that if you didn't watch it, you wouldn't understand that. You didn't need to, but it was a fun wink to those who did know that. I want to ask you, Patrick, one thing that was kind of unsettling to me, which seems weird to say (laughs) (laughs) related to this movie, but the character Will Arnett voices is a beloved character from Disney's past. (laughs) And the original voice actor for that character has kind of a tragic history. Mm, mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I don't know why this sat with me so weirdly, like it probably shouldn't have, but I just felt very odd about Disney taking a character of their own, a very beloved character in Disney's Mm. catalog of characters and kind of twisting the character to be darker than originally portrayed. And then I just couldn't help separating the dark past of the person who originally voiced that character. Yeah. Like it felt like Disney was doing a disservice to the actor who originally voiced the character Mm. after they kind of used that actor for their own purposes and then didn't really feel the need to be a part of that person's life anymore. Does that make sense? I know this is very confusing to those that haven't watched it, but... (laughs) But it felt very weird to me. I can see what, yeah, I, I totally understand that. And and hmm, that, yeah, now I, I don't know how I feel about it anymore. I see what you're saying. It didn't sit that way with me. I, I gave it a thought, but then I was I was just like, I, you kind of have to put that aside, I guess. Because this is a character that Disney actually has done some storylines in other worlds within Disney, where yeah. the character is a little bit more villainous than you th- actually think that he is. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. I just think there are so many Disney characters they could have pulled from. And they Mm. picked the one where the person who originally voiced the character just has this very dark, tragic outcome. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you could have gone so many different ways, but you landed on this character. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I just I guess I detached myself from the person who played it originally and just focused on the character itself, which is totally understandable. Like, I don't know why (laughs) that affected me so much, but yeah, I'd be interested in other Tweedles. If you've seen the film, let me know if that clicked for you at all. Or maybe it didn't like maybe I'm just like the lone wolf in this situation. But it was just very odd. Mm. But it could be just my weird brain. No, I mean, I, I totally. Well, yeah, fair, fair enough. I do. I, I fully, <laughs> I fully see what you're saying. I just, I, I guess it just didn't it hit me the way it hit you that way. Regardless, Chip and Dale mm. Rescue Rangers, a reboot? Question mark. Do you think we'll be seeing more from this team of comedy writers creators? Will this spin off into potentially a new series or another film? I'm interested myself to know that. I'm kind of conflicted on it, too. I, I, I'm i not sure. They did set themselves up well to do a reboot, mm-hmm. maybe, of of the, the cartoon itself, maybe a sequel of this movie. Who can say maybe a version of this movie that is the new show? I don't, I don't know what they might do with it. It seems clear that we're probably going to get some more Disney afternoon reboots. I know we already know that a Darkwing Duck is around the corner. Corner, which mm-hmm. many fans are excited about, and they gave a little nod to that in this movie. So hard to know. I I am fully on board with a reboot in general of the Disney Afternoon lineup. Let's see what's to come. I could see some very successful shorts being produced based off mm-hmm. this movie. Yeah, yeah. It strikes me as interesting that we are. <laughs> we've talked about some heavy things, some light things, some some off the wall things in regards to a movie called Chippendales Rescue Rangers. I think that for me makes this <laughs> a successful movie in that it's like I said, it's Chippendales Rescue Rangers, but it is it's so layered and so I think it's so smart and clever, and there are things for everybody. You may not emotionally attach to it the way I did, uh, and you may not love the comedy the way. They that you didn't so much, but you and I both found things that we liked about this movie and a lot to talk about. 
Well, let's keep that conversation going then, shall we? Tweedles, Mm. it's up to you. We want to hear all about your (laughs) thoughts, your feelings regarding Chippendale Rescue Rangers on Disney+. Plus. You can reach out to us on social media. That's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at GDTD Podcast. Or leave us your voice memos or emails at info at gaysdothed.com. How about that Paula Abdul? Adam, is she is she getting a reboot? <laughs> she is Patrick. We're about to experience an Abdulessance. <laughs> oh, that that makes me feel weird and gross, but I I appreciate it. I appreciate what you said. <laughs> Straight up now, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep the Abdulassans going. What I really mean is, hey, straight up now, Adam. <laughs> hey, Patrick. You know, I had the cassette tape in my oh. Walkman that I would listen to on repeat on drives to my grandmother's house. Ooh, did you pretend to be Paula Abdul or DJ Scat Cat? Always Paula. Always Paula. (laughs) Always Paula, never a scat cat. (laughs) Reach out, Tweedles. Are you a Paula or a scat cat? (laughs) I think we know the answer. I think (laughs) we know the answer for some of you. Adam, we've reached the end of our episode, which only means one thing. It's time for a sandwich. Mmm, what's on that Sammy, PK? Um, maybe a little hummus, a little oh. bit of tomato, mm-hmm. maybe some cheese, okay. lettuce. Yep. Just a sensible summer sandwich. <laughs> Is that a thing? Getting a lot of fiber there. Good for you. Yeah. Well, I need to push some things out, Adam. I need to get rid of some stuff. <laughs> What I actually meant to say was, it's time for Quick D. (laughs) It is time for Quick D, and it sounds like we're doing classic Quick D this week, Patrick, which means Quick D question? Quick D question, indeed. For those who don't know, Quick D classic is where Adam and I ask each other a question we have not been privy to prior to recording, and we answer it, y'all. We just answer that question straight up. Now, tell me. (laughs) (laughs) It started here today, folks. You heard it. The Abdulassans started today. <laughs> We're making it happen. We're making it a thing. Adam, do you want to ask me first or do you want me to ask you first? You ask me. Fair enough. Fair enough. Here we go, Adam. Now that you've chosen to take your ball and go home, you're quitting the show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to let you forget this for the next five episodes. Adam, (laughs) what's something you regret doing here on Gaze to the D? And what's something you have to mouth off about at me on Gaze to the D? Bring it. Something I regret and something that I'm upset at you about? Yeah, something you have to get off your chest right here, right now, now that you're leaving. We only have five episodes left for you to let your feelings be heard and known here on the show. What if they're one and the same thing? That, that, that makes it all the better. <laughs> Is it asking me to be on the show? <laughs> That's 100% correct. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> I regret it, and I'm mad at you for accepting. And the world stands with you. <laughs> <laughs> we are one. I can hear them singing behind you. <laughs> it seemed impossible, folks, but there is one thing that brought the world together, and it is our <laughs> agreement that Patrick should have never been a part of GDTD. <laughs> now he's, he's with it forever. With it forever. Can't get rid of him. Yeah, that's my answer. And uh, <laughs> I think all of our Tweedles will agree with me. No, in all honesty, I mean... What are these next five episodes going to be? They they cannot be a retrospective, but I do want to say that the smartest thing I ever did mm. was selecting you as a, not selecting you, but asking you to join me on this journey. You plucked me from obscurity, Adam, and gave me a purpose. I found him in a gutter and I said, you kid, you've got it. Come with me. <laughs> I'm still in that gutter, I will admit, <laughs> but... Now with a microphone. (laughs) Yeah, never leave the gutter. That's where people want you. That's where people need you. That's where they know how to find me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
I was going to take it to a serious place, but we can't do it yet. We got to save it for episode 200 and then I'll, I'll be very sincere in that episode, Patrick. Mm, I don't know what that looks like on you, so I'm excited to find out. It's going to be the most upsetting GDTD episode <laughs> ever produced. <laughs> Stay tuned, folks. Stay tuned. All right, Patrick, here is my question for you. Mm. We did not cover this in the news, but last week, very exciting, the lineup for the Eat to the Beat concert series was announced. <laughs> That's right. They will be appearing in the 2022 Epcot International Food and Wine Festival. All of these fabulous acts. Patrick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I need you to name three of the acts that are going to be appearing <laughs> in the Eat to the Beat concert lineup. I think you can do this just off the top of your head based on previous years, but let's see if you can. Yeah. Uh, Weird Al Yankovic and the Weather Girls. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Teaming up, finally. <laughs> I'd love to see it, though. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> it's raining spam. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's good to get that spam promotion in there, too. Some The Eat to the Beat concert series brought to you by spam. Brought to you by fried spam. Mm. Okay, so are you actually asking me if I can name three of them? <laughs> can you name three of the acts? Coming to the Eat to the Beat concert series. Oh, gosh. Okay. See, this is where I falter. I, Me and names um, do not go well together. Uh, what, what's your name? Cliff? Um, <laughs> let's see. That's why I'm leaving. He never knew who I was. <laughs> I still don't. Still don't. Um, is... Is Twisted Sister one of them? <laughs> no, but that would also be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Amy Grant, is Amy Grant performing this year? No, but that seems like it would be a good fit, Amy Grant. Maybe next year. Doesn't it just? Wow, you'd think I, I hosted a podcast, but I clearly not the case. Um, we've talked about this for the past three years, and it's the same people every year. Uh, um... Guns and Roses. Guns and Roses is one of them. <laughs> your, your Eat to the Beat concert series is truly amazing. Like, I want that to be real. With new lead singer, Mandy Moore. <laughs> <laughs> that will do it for this episode of Gaze Do the D. Thanks for listening. To become a patron of the podcast, visit our website at gazedothed.com slash donate. For a donation of any amount, you can receive exclusive Gaze Do The D content and help us continue to bring you the very best Disney news and discussion. Continue the conversation after this episode on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at GDTD Podcast, and submit your questions or show ideas to info at gazedothed.com. Have a great week, everybody. See you real soon. Oh,